This is the sermon for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Our gospel lesson is taken from the 21st chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 23rd verse. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. From where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Today's Gospel lesson focuses on another well-known parable of Jesus. The son who said he was going to work for his father. The son who gives lip service to his father, as it were, and then never does anything. And the son who at first tells his father no, and then presumably thinks it over, and goes out and works for him anyway. Of course, it's not hard to draw a moral lesson from this story. At the end of the day, what really matters is what one does, far more anyway, than what one says one will do. It's obvious to us, and we may all have experienced this phenomenon on some level. There is the friend who promises to be there through thick and thin, and then, when things get tough, they are nowhere to be found. It's hard, I suppose, to read this passage and not be led to think of politicians and their, alas, more than occasional empty promises. And maybe, just maybe, we too have been on the other side, at least a few times, of having said, oh yes, I will do this, I will be this, I will always, only to realize we too have fallen short. Well, as valuable and apropos as the moral lesson is, I believe there is even more here for us if we take a closer look. The first thing we might want to consider is the question the temple rulers ask Jesus at the beginning of our text. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Perhaps that's not such an unreasonable question, but what might be helpful for a deeper understanding is to know what they were referring to when they say these things. Of course, they could have been talking about quite a lot. By now, Jesus' fame had reached significant proportions, so they could have been referring to any number of miracles or teachings. But in this case, I think the question is specific. If we look to the beginning of Matthew chapter 21, we will see that our story takes place during the last week of Jesus' earthly life, right after, in fact, the so-called triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the day many celebrate as Palm Sunday. Perhaps even more to the point, 
Jesus has, according to our text, just made something of a scene in the temple courtyard by overturning the tables of the money changers and the seats of the pigeon salesmen. Then, even more notably, he went about healing the lame and the blind and willingly received the messianic adulations of the little children who cried Hosanna to the son of David. So the authorities wanted to know, where do you get the right to act like this and here of all places? Just a word on that business of turning over tables in the courtyard. We were often led to believe, I think, that Jesus just lost it in the sight of what was taking place in and around what was supposed to have been a place set aside for worship. I suppose that might be the case, but I am more inclined to believe that this so-called cleansing may not have been a sudden emotional outburst, but rather a calculated statement. One designed to let people know that their system of coming to God with blood sacrifices was at an end, along with all the inherent corruption that went along with it. When Jesus called the place a den of thieves, I believe it wasn't just that the money changers were charging an exorbitant rate for changing foreign money into ceremonially clean temple money or that the pigeon sellers were somehow selling overpriced inferior birds, but rather that the whole nature of the system is one that robbed people of their relationship to their Heavenly Father and replaced it with a sense of a God that must be placated with the death of animals. The events which immediately follow, Jesus' healing of those of little account and no good repute, the blind and the lame, those who would have more than likely been unwelcome within the temple itself, followed by his ready acceptance of the praises of the little ones, those who ordinarily would have no political voice, shows that whatever Jesus' mindset at the time, he is clearly showing them, God is not the way you think. Here, let me show you what my Abba is really like. Of course, we also read that the leaders were indignant. Of course they were. From their perspective, Jesus' behavior was obnoxious. Now, that's not a word we usually tie to the Son of God, but think about it. Imagine someone barging into the local church flea market and turning over the tables full of second-hand trinkets and home-baked goods, ordering the merchants out, and then making an angry-sounding religious speech. Jesus' behavior, from the point of the establishment, was obnoxious. It was out of order. And as Jesus returns to the temple the next day, they were looking for an explanation. Who gives you the right? Well, if Jesus' behavior was obnoxious previously, his answer to the temple rulers does absolutely nothing to elevate him in their opinion. Okay, you answer my question first, and then I'll tell you. Really? Well, on one level, that's not all that unusual rabbinical repartee. It was a kind of debating technique, question upon question. But from the ruler's vantage point, they were not having a theological or semantic debate. They simply wanted an explanation for Jesus' behavior. They are left presumably disappointed by his answer. Of course, at first, they are willing to at least attempt to take a stab at the question until they realize Jesus has trapped them with a query with no good answer, at least no good political answer. What about John the Baptist's teaching? From above or from man? And we know the rest. If they were to say from man, 
the common folk who still revere John the Baptist will hear about it, and there will be trouble. On the other hand, if they said his teachings were from heaven or from God, they could readily anticipate the next volley. So why didn't you listen to him then? So they cannot answer Jesus' question, and they receive no answer to their own. Instead, Jesus does what he does so very often. He brings the conversation back to the place where it needs to be, not giving people what they want, but rather what they need. And in this case, he does so with yet another parable. Now, they're probably wondering why he is telling the story. It seems so very obvious. The son who actually went out to work for his dad was the good one. We get that. What's your point anyway, Jesus? And then he does the most obnoxious thing of all. He equates them, the rulers of the temple, the most upright among their society, with a son who only gives lip service to his father, and suggests to them that they are less honorable than the lowest of the low. The tax collectors and prostitutes, crooks and whores, are getting into God's kingdom ahead of them. In short, Jesus does in a story the same thing he did in actions the previous day. When Jesus first got to the perimeter of the temple, he drove out the money changers and sellers of sacrificial livestock. Those who by society standards were doing the right thing. Those money changers, they were in some ways the first century equivalent of church workers, people spending their lives in the service of religion. They were upright people, good people, industrious people. But Jesus dismisses them, and he effectively disrespects them, only to show favor to those whom society believed God had harshly judged, those who suffered from blindness, those who had some other ailment that appeared without cure, those considered to be the lowlifes by the understanding of the day. And, oh yes, the children, the ones with no power, no clout, those are the ones Jesus placed above the decent businessmen and church workers. And now, in the story, Jesus even goes so far as to place social pariahs like thieves and prostitutes above those who have risen to the places of highest honor. They, it seems, will achieve the kingdom of God. They'll get it. They'll have it inside them and among them long before the temple rulers ever will. Okay, so the first will be last, and the last first. Divine inversion. But why? What's so great about the lowlifes anyway? We still have whores and robbers today. And we still have church workers and religious authorities. And come to think of it, we probably still have money changers in our temples in one fashion or another. Is the same equation still true today? If I said yes, would you consider the answer to be obnoxious? I certainly hope so, because one, it means I'm in really good company, and two, it means you're probably getting the gist of this. Most of you listening to this who have stuck with it for the last 10 or 15 minutes, are probably church people, or at least you identify as Christian or some form of religion. And I believe that this story is saying to us religious folk, to us church people, that we need to accept that Jesus would have us know that there are people we don't like, the people we, in fact, look down on, who were probably getting into, who were probably achieving God's kingdom ahead of us. Why? Because, frankly, they know they are in need of something, and that something is transformation. 
transformation, the change from one thing, from one state of being, from one behavior pattern into another. That's made all the more clear as Jesus invokes John the Baptist in his counter-question to the religious leaders. The message of John the Baptist was repentance, transformation, a change, an about-face, as it were, and Jesus equates that message, that message of transformation, to righteousness. And those who are in need of change, they get it. The man who is blind knows that he wants to be able to see. The person who is lame knows that he or she needs to be made whole. Just as the one who has resorted to theft or to selling his or herself body and soul knows that life is not what it should be. There must be change, restoration, regeneration, transformation. But when, like those good people to whom Jesus spoke, we are convinced of our own superiority, our own rightness, we perceive no need for change, and it becomes so very hard for us to find the kingdom of God. But there is hope. There is a little bit of shining light. Jesus does not say to those church people of his day, Oh, you will never get in. You'll never get it. You will never find it. He simply says to them that others, specifically those they considered far inferior, are actually much further on the journey than they. So for us, as we reflect on our place on the journey, we might do well to follow the example of those of no account, those whom Jesus exalted above the good and the right. We would do well to recognize the simple fact that God's kingdom is not a place not so much an arrival point, but rather a state of renewal, a state in which we are transformed and, in fact, are being transformed. If we can recognize those places we have been complacent and arrogant, those places where you have set down the wrong path, or like the lip service son from the parable, never left the couch, if we can recognize those places, and like the son who at first did not want to work for his father, change our minds, change our hearts, allow the spirit of Jesus to transform us, then we too can join the ranks of the lowly whom God our Father exalts.